like you said, the award that I won um, was for emerging writers um, under 30. So that's me, right? I'm, I, this is my very first residency. This is probably the first time anyone's ever asked me to talk about myself for a while. <laughs> to a bunch of different people. So um, bear with me. I, I work with I work with teachers a lot of the time. It's my my job, my day job. The Art Mobile of Montana, which is also funded by National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and one teacher told me recently. Every time you do something, you learn something new. You learn how to do it. So this is my first time, my first time learning how to talk like this to people. Um, okay, so uh, he mentioned the the essay that I wrote for that for the Montana Quarterly. Um, it was it's called Counting by Twos, and it's it's about my time that I had last year. Um, working and teaching art, teaching high school art at a little school in Nashua, Montana. So I'm from Glasgow, and Glasgow's on the High Line in northeastern Montana, population 3,000, and Nashua is about 14 miles east of, of that. Um, their, that population in Nashua is 300 people. Um, and so I, I didn't have any education training. Um, they were in desperate need of an art teacher, um, so I said I'd come, and I had just graduated my undergrad, and so I show up, I show up in Nashua, and I don't know what I'm doing by any means, like, at all. I have no idea how to write a lesson plan, um, just start kind of, just start doing it. And um, it was really fun, it was really rewarding, and it was also really intense. So the, the essay was about that, it was about that intense experience. Um, a lot of the things that I wrote about Nashua were a critique, a critique of the area and of the culture. And the reason I was able to see those, those complexities um, were because I, I'm not just a Northeastern Montanan. I, I, it's not normal to me anymore. I grew up there and I can see it and I can understand it. And um, I know the people so well, um, even if I never met them before. But also, I have this really complex um, self-identity, and um, just like Montana, Montana is not just one thing. We are not just you know the eastern side of the state and the western side of the state, like it seems it has become. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think that writing nonfiction is how we can kind of bridge that divide and communicate across states, across the state, and across um, across personal divides. So that, that's how I was attempting to come at my essay about Nashua. Seeing, seeing the problems of a community like that, a beautiful community that I love, but with fresh eyes and being able to point out some of those issues. So, um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is the importance of having this, um, using, your, using your multifaceted identity to see through um, to see through the, the things we take for granted and the things that we find to be normal. Um, okay, so I grew up uh, in Glasgow, like I said, and I'm the youngest of six. Um, my dad grew up in Hinsdale, Montana, which is 30 miles, or yeah, about 30 minutes west on the High Line as well, on Highway 2. Um, and his grandparents homesteaded in the area, and we are Swedish, and it is very much, you know, we are that part of my family is very much northeastern Montana. Um, but my mom is from Texas. She's from Houston. And so living in that area was really difficult for her. I mean, she's, um, she's always, she said a lot that opera was her lifeblood. That's, you know, she just she loved opera and something. So she would take, um, she would take us up to Canada to see the orchestra and sit there to see the symphony. And she'd take us to Alberta Bear and Billings to see the ballet. And I think that there were there were some other people in town that were like that and had childhoods like that, but it was something that we never were able to take for granted because it's not like we were going on vacation and staying in fancy hotels after the ballet. I think that sometimes we drive right home um, after getting the ballerinas to sign our programs and um, <laughs> getting you know so excited. Um, so uh, so we had that. We we listened to like the book. The soundtrack of my childhood was Les Miserables and Big River and Family Opera, 
and we would travel. We, I saw a big river at the Alberta Bear, and it was amazing. Um, and we also were a big part of the Fort Peck Theater in northeastern Montana. So my mom, having her arts background, she planted herself firmly on the Fort Peck Fine Arts Council. Um, and she was on it, I think, for the longest anyone has ever been on that board, 30 years or so. And um, yeah, and so my, like all of us, all six of us, actually all eight of us, because my parents both took part as well, did the theater my whole life. So I mean, that definitely built a strong foundation for the arts in my life and probably separated separated my experience from the rest of the people that I knew and that I grew up with in the area. Um, so, let's see here. <laughs> um, but my dad, oh right, so okay, so we're, we're listening to music, we're going to the plays, we're doing all of this. Um, I, you know, could sing so many musicals right now from probably beginning to end. But I, <laughs> I also um, read a lot. Um, my parents, they filled the house with books, and so I would read Nancy Drew. I, I'd go to bed with a stack of probably six books and read them all until the sun came up. Um, and that was, you know, that was supported. My dad, he, he's, a, he's a rancher. Um, we are really different in a lot of ways, but he has a small bull operation in northeastern Montana, and he worked for the, um, he was a manager of the Valley County BLM for most of my life. And, uh, then he was a ranch hand, and now he is the county, one of the county commissioners for Valley County. Um, so he, I mean, forever had been this the root that kept us in northeastern Montana, and was he's this, the um, the symbol of all the attitudes of northeastern Montana as well. Um, so all of these different things kind of came together and created my my childhood that allowed for me to be interested in the arts, but also grounded in, in the reality of Montana. So by the time I was um, a freshman in high school, all of my siblings had, had gone to college. Uh, my brother, Andy, who's nine years older than me, was probably the biggest influence because he taught me how to draw um, when I was really little. And he also gave, gave me the books that he thought I should read, and he taught me how to listen to good music and um, be funny and wrestle and he's, you know, he's great. So all of my, my four amazing, or sorry, my five, how many? Five. My, <laughs> my five, um, you know, amazing, supportive, fun, funny uh, siblings, they were all gone. They were off to college. And so this did a couple of different things. Um, First of all, it gave me the opportunity to travel. They, throughout you know, middle school and high school, they were living in Bozeman and Missoula, but also in Chicago and Seattle and Arizona. And I was able to visit all of those places um, when I was just you know, in middle school and on through high school. And them being gone also made me very lonely. Um, so, <laughs> which is a dangerous thing. A lonely high schooler can be a lot of things. Um, so I, <laughs> so here I am, you know, I'm in Glasgow, Montana, middle of nowhere. I know that the world exists. I've been, I've seen a lot of the places. I've been there, um, and I'm still working on the farm. So I, I, I connect with that. I connect with that um, culture of the area, but I don't really fit in with those people. Um, and then my friends that I start hanging out with are the the art kids you know, the punks that smoke cigarettes and things like that. Um, and they uh, probably, most of them have really hard home lives. So it was this, this world that I was living in kind of with my wholesome Catholic family and um, the farm and ranching life, traveling to a place all over the country and also having these friends where I was seeing the real, um, the real destructive nature of uh, an unsupportive family, what that can do to a person. Uh, when I was 17, I moved to to Bisbee, Arizona, which is a lot like Butte, actually. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's it's a lot like Butte. Um, it's like if you took Butte and made it really tiny, and then um, all the houses were like just like full of like hippies, like, <laughs> and and they're all just like bright pink and bright blue, and it, it's really beautiful. But it's a tiny little town. So I lived there my fresh or my 
first semester of senior year of high school. So this is a while ago. Um, and my sister, it was her first year of teaching. She was teaching fifth grade. And the town, I mean, the poverty level was, you know, just heartbreaking. Um, and I was, for the first time, had friends of different backgrounds. You know, people were speaking Spanish, and like I was noticing all these things about, about the place um, that they didn't notice, right? So this is kind of going back to this idea of um, being able to tap into the things that you recognize in a person and, and seeing something about themselves that they can't see themselves. Or um, having, coming from a small town, understanding the importance of the state and the landscape and where you're from as a part of your identity and then going to another place and taking all of that knowledge with you in order to relate to these new people. And then you can, you can see in those new people something that they don't see in themselves. And that's kind of that's what I started noticing in Arizona was I was I was taking um, notes basically like physical notes probably in journals and things of all the stuff that I noticed every day that the people there probably didn't couldn't have told me themselves or, or wouldn't really be that interested in seeing unless you wrote it really well. So I'm gonna get to that in a second. Um, <laughs> um, here. Yeah, for one little anecdote of living in Bisbee was, I was, um, I was in class and one of the te a teacher said, okay, everybody in here, I want you to really understand um, poverty. So like, I mean, raise your hand if you've ever actually never known when your next meal was going to come. And she expected like no one to raise their hand, but pretty much everyone did. Um, and so then that, that, that thing, I noticed that and I carry that story with me. And those little things that you can notice are are what makes your stories come alive, right? And that's that's what I think is important about nonfiction. Um, let's see here. So, so when I lived in Bisbee, I missed Montana for the first time, and I think that was really important for who I am now. Um, I had I had lived in, in you know all through high school. I hated it. I hate living here so much because I'm a teenager. And, and but then I, I left, and for the first time ever, I just wanted to go back so bad. And I think that my obsession, I have this obsession now with Montana, and just with, um, with landscape as identity in general, and that's where that started, uh, having that passion, having that, that feeling. Um, so when I got back to Glasgow, even though I missed it, I had my my teen angst, you know, rose about 100%. And um, it was really hard. I mean, I was 18. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. Um, and my, my high school friends that um, I mentioned were, they were like getting into drugs and things were looking really bad in a lot of ways. And I was working two jobs and going to like two classes a day. And um, even though it is just, honestly, just teen angst at the time, it felt really real. And um, so I've been reading through this collection called <laughs> Ernest Hemingway on Writing. It's what it sounds like. It's a, um, a collection of snippets of letters by Ernest Hemingway. Because um, he never wrote a book about writing, but he wrote about writing a lot in letters to other people. So um, here's a, a little quote um, about suffering in a letter to F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, forget your personal tragedy. We are all bitch from the start, and you especially have to hurt like hell. Have to be hurt like hell before you can write seriously. But when you get the damned hurt, use it. Don't cheat with it. Be as faithful to it as a scientist. But don't think anything is of any importance because it happened to you or anyone belonging to you. So, I think in that moment at the end of high school, I was feeling all these this anger, anger this true anger. Um, and at the time, I was too young to realize that it was a pretty boring anger, but it, I was able to use it, and you can channel those feelings, right? And um, so I have, yeah, the soup. The soup is coming together. I have experiences that put life into context. I have this pain to channel um, and make it interesting. Um, but even though it was pretty boring, I had it. So that's the, that's the balance, I think, is important in in any art, really, you have, you have the pain, the struggle, you have the story that you want to tell, 
and then you have the outlet. Um, my friends that I mentioned, they were, you know, they were art kids. They had, they had talent and they were smart, um, but they eventually lost themselves in their frustrations. They didn't have, they didn't have the outlet that I had. Um, and the reason I was able to have it was because it was provided to me from my family. So um, I ended up drawing a lot. I mentioned my brother taught me how to draw when I was little, and I ended up doing that all the time. That was, you know, what I assumed to be my identity. And even though I was, I was also writing. Um, I was journaling, and it, you know, it's it's hard to write anything that anyone wants to read, especially when you're a teenager. So I was writing bad poetry. Um, I was writing how I felt. Oh man, I feel this way. I feel this way. Um, and I was drawing. So. I chose drawing. I went to school at the University of Montana um, to, to draw, to do art. Apparently, now people tell me that they always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> they, they saw something I didn't, I guess. Um, so after a year of art school, I moved to Washington. I lived in Bellingham for a year. Um, and then I came back to school and quickly changed to creative writing. Um, immediately, it was a nonfiction class I took um, that it was just obvious. It was just so clear and that while well, I was there that it was what I wanted to do. I think a big part of it was because I wasn't, I didn't know how to do it very well. And I wanted to. And it was like, am I going to go through college, home, like com continuing to draw, continuing to do something I feel confident in? Or am I going to go through college doing something that I've never done before and getting better at something that seems really challenging? And I did. So that's, that's what I chose to do. I chose to, to focus in nonfiction. And I, I kept noticing things. Um, I was a little bit older than all of my peers because I had switched majors and taken a year off. So I just watched them like a scientist and thought about all of their habits and their social circles. And I was only two years older than them, most of them, but still, I just was so fascinated. And I think that that, that noticing is what's so important. Um, so yeah, so to get to get good nonfiction, you have to at least the, the kind that I do. You have to live a life that's worth worth telling, <coughs> worth noticing. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to be cliff jumping every day or doing you know what some artists seem to think they have to do is burn out. You know, you have to do crazy stuff all the time. I don't believe in that at all. Um, that kind of crafted drama doesn't appeal to me. To get those good stories, you need to amp up your noticing because the stories are everywhere. Um, I've heard that if you're the smartest person in the room, you have to find a different room. <laughs> and I think that that applies. That applies to a lot of things. If you're the most interesting person in the room, that's, a, you know, that's not a good place to be. So you're not going to find a story there. You have to find a different room. Um, so, yeah, I mean, especially if you look, if everyone around you is yourself. If you're, when I was in college, I would look around, I would see, you know, a room full of people that were my age and interested in writing, and we were all looking at each other for stories, and it's like nothing new is going to come out of this room. Mm -hmm. This is nothing good. I'm not saying nothing good could happen, but it's not going to be something that lasts forever. So, I moved to Nashua. Right? That was part of the um, part of the appeal of teaching in Nashua was, for one thing, it was a job, and I was recently graduated. But also, it was just you have to take opportunities like that, um, and then when they're really hard, you have to write it down. So, um, okay. So, for example, another another example of of finding those stories. When I was living in Nashua, I happened to find this girl who's my age, didn't grow up there. Um, she became my really good friend for the month that we lived there at the same time. And she, uh, she digs for dinosaurs in central Montana um, and is like obsessed with YouTube. So the person, <laughs> she's so different from me. You know, like we would hang out in her apartment or in her little house and she'd be playing video games and I just sit and watch her because I mean, that person is so different from me. And uh, what more could you ask for? 
Um, <laughs> and she, she's amazing. And then I, I got to have days at her lab where she was working on the dinosaur bones and learned all about the dinosaurs and how they, how they, um, they make the, the bones stronger and how they put them together and what kind of mounts they use. And then they, I got to go to her dig site in Big Sandy and dig up dinosaur bones. I, digged up a, I dug up a, a, oh my gosh, a hadrosaur rib. That was my contribution to the, the thing. Um, so that, that, that's, you, you put out your weird antenna, your antenna for the people that are not like you, and then when you find them, you commit to them. That's, that's, my way of, that's my way of doing things, because like I said, I mean, if you're surrounded by people just like you, where's, what's interesting, you know? I do have friends like me, and they're amazing, but um, having that open mind and that willingness to listen and notice things about a person is that's going to make your life? I mean, even if it's even if it's not about writing, it's going to make your life more complete. Um, so let's see here. So those those things happen where you find the weird and you find the, the amazing thing, and then you have a story you need to tell. And for me, it happens where I'll be mad about it. I don't want to write it down. I'm busy. I'm watching TV or something, and I have to. There's the stories going in my head, and I'm like, I'm gonna watch two more seasons of this show, and then, <laughs> and then it's like three in the morning, and then you write it down, and it's still there, and it's really important. Um, so, here's a quote from Richard Hugo, my favorite poet, um, Montana poet, uh, from his book *The Triggering Town*, which is the, I think, it's my favorite book about writing, period. Um, it's about poetry, but it can be applied to all sorts of writing, and probably about life as well. Um, so, in this quote, he uses the word poem, but for me it should be story. Um, the need for the poem to have been written is evident in the poem. This is a strong example of the notion that all good, serious poems are born in obsession. Without this poem, experience would have been neither validated nor completed. So. That. So without this poem or story, the experience would have been neither validated nor completed. And I think that's, at least for me, that's, that's where it all comes from, is this feeling to validate and complete your experiences by, by writing it down and making it real, um, making it something you can share, and also putting into a larger context. Um, because you can't just tell a story, you have to tell it in a new, in a new way. Um, so here's how I do that. Um, so the most important thing, I think, is for a writer to be honest. And that's a, sentence, a sentiment shared by, you know, in every book about writing you've ever read. You have to be honest with your reader. You can't try to lie to, lie to them or trick them. Um, and you have to be honest about how you feel. So I keep myself honest by writing slowly at first. Um, I use, I handwrite my first draft. Um, and as I handwrite, you know, I, I'll, I'll be thinking about the story, okay, this will happen and this happened. And then as I start to find the tangents, the way that my mind is branching off and thinking about something else, even if it feels unrelated, I'll write that down. And then because it's handwritten and it's slow, if, it's, if, the, if the next thought isn't important, you're not going to write it down because you're, you're slowing yourself down enough. So um, I have this, you know, I'll write... Um, I think for this, for this talk, I wrote four or five handwritten pages. Um, so that typewritten, if I did it word for word, would have been a page or something in a Word document. But so what you do from that, from your basically what turns out to be an outline of your key thoughts, um, then you pour that into a Word document. And for me, what happens is things speed up a lot. And for every sentence I hand wrote, um, two or three or a paragraph will get typed up. And then, um, and then you have to give it a rest. You have to walk away. Um, what I like to do is I, I write it all down, I, I type it all up, and I leave it alone because apparently, uh, eventually I'm definitely going to get really frustrated and think that it's really bad, um, <laughs> no matter what. So um, I walk away from it. And it, whether that's um, I mean, 20 minutes or a day or a month or six months, um, when you come back to it, you'll see all these things you didn't see before. 
And um, so my, again, I'm an analog person. I like to hold things. So I like to print it off. I print off my, my, hand, my Word document and I get a pen and a highlighter and I start making notes. Um, double spaced like you're in college, you know. Um, just writing notes and crossing things out. That's the, the revision. Revision is my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, <laughs> revision can take a, a, a garbage, a piece of garbage, and make it amazing. Um, because it, in that step, in that step where it's a Word doc, you're not, no one's going to, you don't want anyone to read that part. You know, I mean, when if someone says, what are you working on, and you think of that Word document you just typed up, the mess. Like, I don't even want to admit that I'm working on something because I'm afraid they're going to ask to read it. And, and that's, not, that's not the step that anyone should, should be um, privy to. Um, and so then it's all about revision. And it's about noticing what you notice. Like I was saying earlier, when you're reading through and you think, that's an idea. Oh, you know, I forgot that I wrote that. That's something. And you circle it and you, you remember that that's important in your story. And then the rest of the paragraph might be crossed out entirely. Um, a phrase that people say is kill your, kill your darlings. Um, I, I initially heard it as kill your babies, but that is a little bit harder for people to hear, I think. But um, kill your darlings, when, if you're writing, if you wrote something that you love and it just gives you like a heart attack because you love it so much, and then so you just are trying to preserve it and you rewrite the whole paragraph around it, and you're just trying to make it work, it probably doesn't belong. And I love it when I see things like that. I love it when I get to the point where I can see what truly doesn't belong, because then you can get rid of it, and you can move on, and it's a better essay for it. And if you write it down on a piece of paper and you, on a sticky note and put it on your computer, maybe you can use it again. Um, and the cool thing about it, too, is if you love something that you wrote so much, that means you still wrote it, even if you got rid of it. So you can do, you can, you're still the person that wrote that amazing thing. The next time you write, that talent is still there. Um, you, we can't get so attached to our words that they control us. Um, it's not about that. Um, I think that's kind of where I separate from Richard Hugo. In his book, he talks about you owe everything to the words. It's all about the words, and I'm kind of. That knew that's why I'm not a poet. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the stories are really important. Um, yeah, so when you move on, when you move on from those darlings, um, you have to remember that writing, writing like life is fluid, and you are moving ever onward. You need to be confident, not in love with yourself. Um, and then, what happens is you probably, or for me, don't. It doesn't get published. <laughs> oh well, you know, that's, that's how I think about it. If you're doing your job and you're writing enough, um, if a tenth of the things that you write get read by someone, then you're doing a pretty good job. If you're writing enough, you know, then that's, that tenth is a substantial amount. Um, and I feel good about that. I think it's about um, ident uh, defining, your own, defining your own success and what success means to you. If success for me was getting a collection of essays published, like a book, would I, would I be a failure until then? You know, so success for me is, um, is writing and writing well, and that's, that's where I keep it. I keep it simple like that. So, um, yeah, so it's a hard life to commit to, um, and sometimes I think we all want to be free from it a little bit, um, but it can't happen. It can't be ignored. Um, here's another thing. Okay, so I was obviously reading this Hemingway book and Hugo recently. Um, Hemingway said, Dostoevsky was made by being sent to Siberia. Writers are forged in injustice as a sword is forged. Um, so that kind of brings us back to what we were talking about with, you know, National Endowment for the Arts. Um, <laughs> right now, injustice is everywhere and we're all feeling it and everyone's really mad. And Montana is, like I said, I'm pretty obsessed with Montana and it is almost like you can draw a line down the center and, and say one side is this way and the other side is this other way. Um, and it's not true. Um, 
like I said, my dad, my dad is, I probably do everything for my dad um, because we're so different and because I just, you know. Um, so I write, I write for my dad because I think that if we can figure out a way to communicate across those lines and tell the important stories that we, we feel are important and you can do it in a way that is relatable because we are complicated people with complicated identities, we can do real good in the world. And I think about um, those boys in high school, the problems, <laughs> I think of them as the problems sometimes, um, because they were so good in so many ways, but they didn't have that outlet to, to save themselves with. And why didn't they have that outlet? Well, because they didn't have the support. And I'm lucky enough because I have my family, and they're amazing, and not everyone has that. And if we cut off the rest of the world from our deep belief in the arts, then we're creating this monolithic identity where we're like, giving the people that don't have access even less access to why the arts are so important. And that's why we have to keep writing and have to keep making art. And even if we're not talking about politics, we're not talking about art, having a way where someone in Glasgow, Montana is gonna pick up my essay and say, this is really good. Oh, I respect this young writer. It's pretty cool that a young person is able to write. And that simple thought um, being available in a place that is so dry um, for art can create this climate of, of artistic ability and creativity and support for young people. Um, obviously, I mean, I have gotten into education unexpectedly. I didn't think that was gonna happen. Um, so now even more, everything that I, that I do, I think about the young people and how they can be saved, like literally saved um, from the arts. So we have to lead by example, and writing, writing for our, for our cool hipster friends, um, <laughs> that's not going to change the world. Um, writing, write, uh, I'm not that interested in writing online for, you know, writing reviews for cool movies. That doesn't really get me because I'm not accessing, accessing the people that think differently from me. Um, okay, let's see if I have anything else. Yeah, so I guess um, I feel like even I have to choose sometimes between my identities. I, I live in Missoula, you know, and I grew up in Glasgow. And people in Glasgow say, why do you live in Missoula? This place is full of weirdos. And, uh, I, <laughs> and then the people in Missoula say, you know, sorry about where you grew up. And yeah. it's, this, it's this horrible thing because I, I love it there, you know? I love it in, in both places. And I think that if anybody could, if, you, if we remind people to consciously open their minds, then they can also appreciate both sides of the state, right? Um, and I think, I think art is like one of the only ways to do that. So, let's see. Yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> so, um, we have a little time for a question and answer. I'm Carson Becker, I'm the program director for the Root and the Bloom Collective with my cohort, Kelsey Stratton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tess is going to be reading at the Clark Chateau in the ballroom this Saturday at 7 p.m. Six. Is it six? Oh, it's six. six. Sorry. Six. 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 Thank you. And I think I'll be reading the essay that I wrote for the quarterly. So I talked about that today. So if you're interested. Yeah. Um, so uh, 